the last 10, 15 years, there's been some really major technical advancements and we've been able to, to use, utilise those and, and incorporate them in our study. So proven, tested and it works. Well, hello, welcome to Assay TV. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Duncan Crabe, who is the Managing Director and CEO of Boss Energy. Boss Energy is an ASX-listed company focused on restarting the Honeymoon Uranium Project in South Australia. Duncan, great to see you today. Um, I'd like to start things off. You've just released an enhanced feasibility study uh, on the Honeymoon Project. Do you want to take us through um, some of the sort of financial highlights of that? Absolutely. But Leo, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today and allow me the opportunity to sort of describe Boss Energy and the Honeymoon uh, Uranium Mine. Honeymoon's basically uh, a, a pure play uranium mine with a brownfield restart asset uh, that previously produced and exported U308 or yellow cake around the world to the global markets before it was placed into care and maintenance due to low uranium prices. So in addition to technical advancements, since we acquired the projects, we've upgraded the resource, we've taken care of permitting requirements, and we've formed really close relationships with fuel buyers. So the, the sort of culmination of all that work resulted in the enhanced feasibility study. And essentially that's further lowered Honeymoon's already globally competitive costs and increased its production profile. So essentially the study highlights a more robust and resilient project demonstrating that we've got the sort of first mover advantage and the next uptick in the, in the uranium price, essentially. So from an from a economic perspective, um, our MPV is now US 309 million, and that's up 35% from our previous study. We've got a fantastic IRR, 47%, EBITDA margin, 62%, nameplate production up to 2.45 million pounds per annum. And our best of all, the, the cost structure, the operating cost structure. So all in costs are down 11% to just shy of 32 US per pound. Your all in sustaining cost has been lowered 16% to nearly 25 US per pound. And cash costs have reduced substantially by 20% to 18 and a half US per pound. So really competitive numbers there. And that excludes, of course, our physical inventory that we hold of, of 1.25 million pounds. Mm. And how have you reduced these costs? I understand you've done some work around the processing um, of the uranium. That's right. So it's really the change in the, in the feasibility study was to adopt an iron exchange process. Now, iron exchange, I guess, put it simply, the sort of the feasibility study was based on revising the capital and operating costs, looking at the well field design, looking at revised economic assumptions. But it's, it's in principle, as you pointed out, the iron exchange. So iron exchange is basically a more efficient process to drive that cost efficiency and improve dilution circuit. Um, had Uranium One, the previous owners, identified a resin that could support iron exchange, they would have chosen that method rather than the solvent extraction process uh, on which the mine was constructed. So essentially, um, our, our, the only change to the plant is really changing that front end of the production process. Mm. And in terms of your well field, uh, it, it's an in situ recovery process. Um, tell us a little bit about the well field design and the enhancements you've made there as well. So well field design, it's, we looked at it, we did a field leach trial in 2017 really looking at two aspects, well field design in terms of where you place your, your actual, your wells themselves and how you actually use your lixivient to leach the, the material from the, the ore body. Um, what we use there in terms of lixivient, we looked across to our neighbourly mine, the Beverly mine, which is situated about 260 kilometres to our west and saw that they, the reagents that they use, the, the sort of lowering of pH, the ferric chloride as an oxidant, and we tested that in a laboratory with Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organization. And then we ran a field leach trial and the, 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 the recoveries that we achieved were fantastic. Uranium one was averaging around 52 milligrams per liter. On average over that six month period, we averaged about 80 to 90 milligrams per liter. So it's really using the type of reagents that we're using has, has been a huge benefit 
And then you look at the placing of the screens within the actual wells themselves. And the screens are far more targeted now to be aligned with the ore body such that you don't pick up the other sedimentary type type deposits. You're really targeting that basal sands where the uranium's hosted. So some big advancements and really using the latest technology. I think, um, Leo, I mean, in situ recovery, iron exchange accounts for over 50% of the world's production. And in the last 10, 15 years, there's been some really major technical advancements and we've been able to, to use, utilize those and, and incorporate them in our study. So it's proven, tested, and it works. Fantastic. Um, as we can see from the picture behind you, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure obviously in place. It's a, it's a restart. What's the, what's the condition of the uh, existing uh, infrastructure? Oh, thanks very much. It, it's, it's in great condition. I mean, uh, since we took over the project in, in December 2015, we've had a continual team of care and maintenance operatives. Uh, which keep turning over the key components of the actual plant itself, such that there's no sort of uh, residue on the tanks, there's no corrosion on the plant itself. Where we're located is in the outback of Australia, some 75 kilometres northwest of Broken Hill. In, um, it's a very, the only exposure to the elements out there is really sunlight. So it's a very stable climate to operate in. And yeah, the plant's in really good condition. We're ready to go. Absolutely. And you touched on it slightly earlier, but the permitting, um, where are you at with that? Permitting, we've done a lot of work on permitting um, over the years. Essentially, we're, we're fully permitted as an operation. So one of four in Australia to have that designation. Um, what, what really encapsulates that is the fact that we have an export permit for up to 3.3 mil, um, million pounds per annum. Um, but to achieve an export permit means that all your environmental permits and all your um, mining licenses are in place. So we've achieved that designation. There's no more permitting to achieve. We've also got our native title um, agreements in place. So by all accounts, we've got full state government support. We've got full federal government support. This is a project that's, that's really ready to go. And obviously, uranium mining and processing is requires some specialist skills. Can you take us through some of the sort of background of your management team? Uh, of course, the background of the management team, essentially, we've all been experienced in the uranium market. Um, I think, um, personally, I've been involved for the last 14 years. Um, uh, worked more recently on the, on the HUSAB mine in Namibia, where I was the finance director, seeing that project through. Um, really from junior exploration stage to, to construction, to commissioning. Um, and, and yeah, fantastic, very large project, the most recently built in the world. Um, Wyatt Buck on the board, extremely experienced, very strong operationally in project execution. Uh, started his career with Cameco, um, had 15 years there, was the general manager of Cigar Lake. Um, and he then was uh, sort of, joined Paladin, he saw their Langer Heinrich mine in Namibia through its, its, its um, commissioning to its nameplate production. And then he oversaw as well the Kalakira operation. So very, very strong operationally. Um, Bryn Jones, our technical director, had his start of his career uh, with our neighbourly mine, which I referred to, the Beverly mine, uh, where he gained strong experience with operating well fields and, uh, and iron exchange. So very, very strong sort of technical group and commercially sound. Uh, we've also got a very dear colleague, Sashi Davies, uh, one of the world's top five uranium traders still of physical inventory. Um, she's based in France in the Northern Hemisphere where the majority of the nuclear power plants are actually located. Uh, with her 35 years experience in the industry, been through four cycles, very, very strong and um, at, at contracting and opening the doors to fuel buyers. So yeah, very, very competent sort of team. We're now looking to, to sort of flesh out more the operating side of the team and, and start at the top and really recruit some of the, the, the key executive management um, to fill those positions. And, and that recruitment drive will pick up in earnest as the, as the um, uranium price begins to lift. But I think South Australia is the premier uranium state in Australia. Uh, the only two operating mines are located in South Australia being Olympic Dam and that Beverly mine. So the skills and expertise and, and what we need as a project reside within the same state as which we operate. Hmm. 
Um, obviously, the uranium price, uranium has been in the doldrums uh, somewhat for the last sort of, you know, 10 years since obviously Fukushima. Um, what's your take on, on the uranium price right now and, and, and where you're expecting it to go in the future? Uh, I think the price is really firming. I mean, what we've seen over the last six months is investor sentiment sort of front running that that price, the uranium price moving. We're seeing phys we're seeing uh, <clears throat> primary producers such as ourselves acquiring physical inventory. We're seeing an increase in, in in interest from fuel buyers and a lot more technical due diligence being taken by utilities assessing projects such as ourselves. So that's the sort of signs that we're seeing, which are very, very encouraging. Um, we're also seeing the Sprott um, UPC transaction go through in the last few days, and now they're looking to dual list on the New York Stock Exchange, and with that, raise significant funds to buy further uh, material off the spot market, all of which will start pressuring the price. So we're feeling very, very confident about the price, and we think that we're well-placed to capitalise upon it. But <clears throat> I keep going back to the, the sort of classical financial theory that the, the whole idea that all the information available in the marketplace is captured in a price of a commodity. And that while that works for general stocks, it doesn't necessarily work for consumables such as energy, such as uranium. And right now we're in a, a sort of operating cost regime where the pressures on sellers or producers such as ourselves to reduce costs and be more efficient, be more competitive. But that undersupply can quickly turn into inducement pricing regime where where, where sort of strong demand cycle fundamentals start kicking in. There's a delayed supply response because on average it takes at least a few years to bring new mines into production. So that shortfall is what we're going to, I believe, experience in uranium similar to the last market where new mines are needed, the supply price is way off where it needs to be to incentivise that production and the industry cannot sort of simply increase primary production straight away or overnight. So when that switch happens to inducement pricing, it can happen very suddenly, very violently, and it really um, can, be, can be quite exciting. So back in 2007, 2008, when I was involved in the industry, the, the spot price was moving by dollars a week. And that's, that's really what, we, what we're sort of expecting and hoping for. And, and you're seeing now more and more existing producers have adopted sort of market-related uh, offtake agreements rather than fixed price agreements. Um, you know, a, another good example, perhaps over the last six months, copper, iron ore, good examples where they've switched from that operating cost regime to that more inducement incentive pricing. And it's going to come a point in the not too distant future where, where we believe that's going to happen for uranium. Hmm. So a lower prices have forced everyone to become, become lean and fit. And uh, when the price starts to rise, you'll be able to benefit from that. So, so what are the next steps um, for you guys? What, what, what are your plans over the next few months? Oh, it's really, we're, we're staying very close to the fuel buyers. I think for us, it's now, we've, we've finished our technical work. Um, it's now staying close to the fuel buyers, getting ready to actually, get, getting them more familiar and happy with the project and, and ready to contract. So for us, it's, it's keeping a focus on that. And we are very well prepared. We've finished the enhanced feasibility study. We've, we've got all our permitting in place. And now it's a question of that price to start rising. So it's, it's important to bear in mind, though, the barriers to exit are far more are far greater than the barriers to entry. So we're not going to rush into an offtake um, deal simply for the sake of it. We're waiting for the prices to start to increase uh, to, to incentivise that. In the meantime, we're also working with financiers to get them comfortable over the project and our, our financial model such that when we do land the offtake agreements, they've already completed a lot of their due diligence such that we can quickly sign up uh, our debt structure. Um, and, and hence raise the necessary capex to, to, go, to go forward. Um, we are also working on our exploration drive. Uh, we, we're just about to start um, that process in the last quarter of this calendar year. We've done all the geophysical work, EM, airborne studies, uh, gravity surveys, geophysical studies, et cetera, such that we've got very um, comprehensive uh, geological models such that we're ready now to go in and start exploring with the rigs but we've been holding off for that spot price to increase so I mean in that regard we've got over our tenement acreage is 2,600 square kilometres 
we've got up to 190 million pounds of additional resource there to explore in, in, in addition to our ready jork resource of 72 million pounds. So significant upside. We just need to get the rigs in there and, and look, to, look to expand upon that. So when you break it down, close the fuel buyers, advance the financing discussions and look to increase our, our economic uh, resource. Mm, a very exciting time for the company. Well, thank you very much for that update on the company, Duncan. And we look forward to uh, seeing how things progress. And please come back and uh, tell us how things are going uh, a little further down the track. Terrific. Thank you very much, Leo. Thanks.